Hey, thanks, Lauren. Uh, this is a really great time in the life of our church because we are embarking on the start of a new ministry year. And every year, our church really does try to have a specific vision or focus that's been prayed over and thought through by our elders and by ministry leaders that points us in a direction that we feel like God has called us. And so this year, we talked about this last week at Vision Sunday. Our vision as a church is to be a community that makes disciples as we go. Another way of saying that is we want to be obedient to what Jesus has called us to do. The last command he gave his disciples before he ascended into heaven was that they should go into the nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and disciple those people in understanding what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So being a Christian is rooted in faith. That is the foundation of everything we do. It's by grace that we've been saved through faith. As an overflow of that faith, there are certain characteristics, certain priorities, certain beats of our heart that reflect the faith that God has given us. And so being a disciple really is growing in those patterns of living the way that we've been called to live. And we have all been discipled by something. Whether we realize it or not, we are all shaped by something. All of us have places that we look to to order our life, to express our passions, to put our trust in something, to worship something, and to live according to a set of values. And we live in a world that really kind of screams at us to be discipled by all of these different voices, right? Like anytime you look at the effects on social media, fascinating, devastating. I think our grandkids will talk to us about social media the way I try to talk to my grandparents about smoking. Like you guys didn't know this was terrible for you? Like how was this a surprise? Um, we, we know we just can't stop because it's cool. There's all of the ways that we're influenced by what is on our phone. There's all of the ways that we're influenced by what is on cable news. There's all of the ways that we are influenced by what people are trying to sell us as a picture of success. As Christians, our, our hope, our goal, our desire is that we are primarily influenced in how we live by what God is passionate about. And Jesus showed us how to do that. As he lived and taught, he was giving his disciples and, and us by extension, a picture of what it looks like to live a life that is in rhythm with God's heart. And so for us this year, we wanna talk about how, how do we do that? What does it mean to be a disciple? How do we follow Jesus? At Roswell Community Church, what does it look like for us to be people whose lives are shaped and formed by what God loves? A little early on that one, but that's okay. It's already up, we can just stay. <laughs> we believe that there are specific rhythms of discipleship or, or, or actions, goals that characterize what our lives look like as a community. And so for the next seven weeks, we're going to specifically go through each one of those rhythms and we'll continue to talk about these things throughout the next year. So here's my question for you. What do you think the biggest barrier in your spiritual life is? What would you say? We talk about this a lot as we've been prepping for this year. What, what do we feel like the biggest barrier in our community being able to grow and live a life that is reflective of the values of God? What is the biggest barrier? Everybody's got an answer for that. Well, the biggest barrier is liberal secularism, um, secularism that's sort of encroaching on American society, right? The culture wars. That's the biggest barrier we face. Other people would say, man, my biggest barrier is my sin, whether that's an addiction, whether that is um, a habit, whether that's a blind spot, whatever it might be a shortcoming, whatever word, that that's my biggest barrier. Other people would say a relationship is my biggest barrier. My career is my biggest barrier. My worry about my finances is my biggest barrier. And, and I think we'd all maybe kind of consider this question and we'd plug in a different answer. I, I want to just pause it as we go into the series of rhythms and why it's so important that we're mindful of these rhythms and that we're enacting these practices the, the biggest barrier culturally for us right now in our spiritual growth might be our calendar. And they're like, well, that doesn't feel as bad as a liberal left-wing agenda, or that doesn't feel as bad as um, an addiction. Well, hang on a second, because I think they're all rather intimately connected. One of the common themes that we hear is we have these deep conversations in small groups or um, in meetings or just over coffee, is that as a congregation, as a community, we're all exhausted right? 
Everyone is tired. Everyone has too much to do. Everyone is too busy. Whether it is jobs that we can't go to our boss and say, hey, you know, we were talking about worship at church this week, and I don't feel like I have enough time to worship. I'm just going to work like halftime this week. Is that cool? Like, we don't have that ability. Um, we, we can't go to our kids' teachers or practices and say, hey, as a family, we're a little burned out this week. We're just going to take the week off from school. There are these big blocks of time and commitment in culture that we are placed into that we don't have the ability to change. And for a lot of us, we feel like we are constantly being thrown around in this dryer of life, just constantly spinning, and we can't get out. And so then we come to church, and we have this hour where we can reflect on the goodness of God and enjoy deep community and celebrate communion. And just for a moment, we get some peace, and then we enter back into it. You say, well, how can I be a disciple of Jesus? I don't have time to wash my clothes. How can I be a disciple of Jesus? My kitchen hasn't been cleaned in like a month. How can I be a disciple of Jesus? I haven't seen my spouse this week. Just haven't seen them. I think the answer lies in intentional rhythms because there's things in life that we can't change. What we can do, what we can do is focus on these rhythms we see throughout Scripture of what a heart that loves Jesus longs for, of what a heart that understands the glory of God and the depth of his grace reflects out into the world. And we can say, okay, am I cultivating these rhythms in my life? Am I making space for these practices? Is my life defined by my love for God, or is my life defined by my busy schedule? And we're going to dig into these places because as a community, this is what we want to look like. When we asked ourselves as elders the question, what does it look like for us to make disciples? One of the guiding questions we asked is, what do we want our life to look like as a community? What do we want to be known for? And so the first rhythm we're going to talk about today is foundational. This is more important than everything else we do, because if we're not rooted in this, then nothing else we do matters. In fact, Scripture would say, without this, we can do miraculous, amazing things, but without this, it's just worthless noise, right? So today we're going to talk about the foundational rhythm that we want to exhibit and embody as a church, and that is that we would live in a rhythm where we are loving other people. You hear this every week here. We say, you are loved, and we mean that. We want to be a people that embodies this rhythm of loving the world around us because we have experienced the love of God. We want to be a people that love the world. So how do we do that? What does it look like for us to live a life that is marked by loving others? What does this rhythm mean? How do we do that? Great place to answer this question is by looking at what Jesus said. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. We're going to be in verse 25, and this is really one of probably the most well-known parables of Jesus, and it is specifically answering the question, what does it look like to live a life that is marked by loving others? And so let's get into it here. Um, saw one of the child care workers strapping something with wires under my car last week after I went long, so I want to keep this moving. <laughs> And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? So let's just stop there for a second, because we, we hear this, and I just want us to have a context. And he says, What should I do to inherit eternal life? You and I, if you've grown up in church, read that as uh, 21st century evangelicals, and we hear eternal life and say, What he's asking is, What do I need to do to get saved? It's just, that's how we say that, right? They didn't have a context for that at this point, right? So Jesus had come to earth. He was instructing and teaching out of the Old Testament to a people whose lens for their relationship with God was rooted in what we call the Old Covenant, or the covenant that God made with his people in the Old Testament, right? There's the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. Those are the two big ones that related to the, the, the nation and the people of Israel. So these people's understanding of life or eternal life when they read this would have been rooted in this idea of being obedient to Torah and understanding that an obedience to God led to his covenant blessings. Which up to this point, they understood as if you worship me as God, I will bless you as a people and you will live long in the land and it will go well for you, right? That was just the grid they had for it. They did not have a fully fleshed out understanding of the new covenant that Jesus had administered. He had started to teach about it 
People were either confused or offended, and he had not yet given the fullness of what it meant to know God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so when we read him asking what does he need to do to inherit eternal life, we want to read it through that lens because otherwise it makes us go to weird places. It makes us think like, wait, I thought we got eternal life through faith. Is Jesus saying we can only be saved by what we do? Because the Bible says we're only saved by faith. Here's how we square that and understand that. The, the legal expert, he was probably a scribe um, or a religious official, is not asking, how do I get saved in an American evangelical sense? What he's asking is, how can I be a good Jewish worshiper who is obedient to Torah and following the law? How can I be right with God? Am I good with God is another way to ask the question that he's asking so we don't hear Jesus say something that he's not saying. Goes to Jesus, says, how do I have eternal life? How can I be a good Jew that's observant of Torah? So Jesus asks him a question back. He says, well, you're an expert in the law. What does scripture say? He quotes the Shema, or at least part of it, and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength and with all your mind. Missed soul there. And your neighbor as yourself. Jesus answered him and says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. That's in Deuteronomy. That was one of the foundational texts of Judaism is that what it meant to love God was that you did two things. You loved the Lord with everything you had and you loved your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's right. That's what the law says. But desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So it's interesting what he wants to justify himself. There's a few different ways that people interpret what that could mean. Um, that he wants to be really sure that he's good. More likely than not, that's not where he was going because all of the religious officials that were coming to Jesus and asking him questions in the New Testament were never doing it because they wanted to know what Jesus thought. Consistently, they wanted to trap him to prove him wrong and to show that their interpretation of the law was superior to Jesus's. So when it says justify himself, it wasn't that he was really concerned that he was doing what Jesus said. More likely than not, he was wanting to show the people around him that were listening that his interpretation of Torah was correct. This is rooted in a couple of different realities. Remember his job. He, he is a legal expert. That doesn't mean that he took the bar. Um, that's not the type of lawyer that they had at the time. This meant that he was an expert in Torah. So he was from a priestly family. At this point in Jerusalem's history, you've got to remember a couple of things have happened since the Old Testament. Alexander did a wonderful job conquering the ancient Near East. Then he drank too much and died. And then everything sort of fragmented. And in the fragmentation of his death, you had all of these different like little mini kingdoms before Rome came on the scene. This is still relatively new in Rome's global preeminence. And so in that time period, Jerusalem went through a lot. They went through being ruled by the Greeks. They went through being ruled by some petty king warlord people. They went through some different pictures of what they had sovereignty over and who their king actually reported to. At the time, it was a puppet king for the Roman Empire. And so the people in this society that tended to be looked at as noble in, the, in a medieval sense, they had the power, they had the wealth, um, they had authority, those were priestly people. The priestly classes were inherently wealthy, they were well educated, they were put together, they were sort of the apex of culture and society. They would have been the influencers on social media, which is a weird parallel if we were to try to explain that to them. And so this wasn't something that you could earn. This was something that you were born into. And that's going to matter because of how he's going to unpack this parable. And so this guy would have been a very wealthy, very well-connected young man who was seen as the apex of what it meant to be a good Jew. Just because of who he was. It wasn't because of what he did. It was because of how he was born and the, the class rank that he reflected. And so when he's trying to justify himself, more likely than not, what this means is he was trying to make sure everyone who was listening to this conversation that he was having with Jesus saw that he was reinforcing the system that they had in place. That these were the good people who exemplified what it meant to new God. And so Jesus is going to tell a story. He says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. 
But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So let's stop there because this is super important and we can miss this pretty easily. When he comes to the third person who stopped by, he says a Samaritan. Um, This would have been unimaginably offensive to the person he was talking to. A seminary professor that I had at DTS put it this way. This would have been probably, this was 2006, and so to give you a culture of context of kind of where we were as a country at the time, he said this idea of a Samaritan doing something right when two Jewish religious officials did something wrong would have been as offensive to a Jew as someone coming into 21st century evangelical America in the early 2000s and telling a story where a member of Al-Qaeda was a hero and members of the U.S. military were the bad guys. He said it was that level of offense. Not necessarily creating a parallel between the two conflicts. It's not what he meant. Don't take it there. But the level of offense would be very, very similar. There was a deep hatred of the Samaritans by the Jews and a deep hatred of the Jews by the Samaritans. And a lot of it was because of what the people of Samaria represented to the Jews. They frankly saw them as half-breeds. They were an abomination and corruption of who the Jews saw themselves to be. And they were an aberration of that covenant that we talked about that the Jews understood salvation through. That God had given his promise that there would be a kingdom based in Israel that would glorify him and that his people would prosper in that kingdom. Here's what happened. Samaria didn't exist forever, okay? So the Assyrians wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel. There's two theories on where the Samaritans came from. One is that when the Assyrians wiped them out, they repopulated that area with their own people. That made the Samaritans what? that made them pagans, that made them unclean, that made them unholy. The other theory that the Samaritans held to is that they were the remnant of God's people that stuck around after Assyria had conquered and destroyed the northern kingdom. And so that was the nature of the conflict. The Samaritans said, hey, we're a part of you. God loves us just as much as he loves you. And the the Jews said, no, you guys are dirty and unclean. We're the chosen people and you're not. And so this rivalry, actually, when you read the history of how really the current setup of Jerusalem that Jesus is living in. Um, You may know in 70 AD, Vespasian led a giant Roman army into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple for the last time. Um, That actually started because of unrest between Jews and Samaritans a little bit to the north. It's fascinating reading. Um, There's a book I can recommend to you. And so there is a massive amount of animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. So when he says the Samaritans showed compassion, that is offensive to everyone hearing it. Because they were the embodiment of everything that was wrong with the world. They were the embodiment of those people that God didn't love. For him to be the good guy in this story does not compute. And we we really have to understand that to get the depth of what Jesus is communicating. So what did the Samaritan do? So he's asking who his neighbor is. There's one person in this story that does not get identified by a label, right? There's four people. There's the priest, there's the Levite, there's the Samaritan, then there's the guy in the ditch. Who do we know the least about in this story? If if you know, you can tell me. The guy in the ditch. We know nothing about his ethnicity, we know nothing about his job, we know nothing about anything other than it's just a guy in the ditch. In this story, we almost subconsciously think This is the guy that needs to be the neighbor because should we care for him? Should we not care for him? That's not really the impetus of the action in the story. Who has the impetus to act like the neighbor? Who has agency to be a neighbor in this story? It's not the unconscious bloody guy. The people with agency are the people that he's helping us have categories for. That's the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. So another way to think about this now, if you want to just sort of um, try to apply who they would be culturally, this would be like Fortune 500 CEO, um, seminary professor, criminal. Okay? Um, It's the best I'm going to do without accidentally being offensive. So let's just leave him as criminal. Um, What made the Samaritan a neighbor? What made him the person who in this story is fulfilling the law that God has called them to. It says it actually in in verse 33. He had what? He had compassion. There were three people in the story. One person showed compassion. So if we want to live a rhythm of caring for other people, of loving the world around us, we have to live life with a rhythm of compassion. Do we have a rhythm of compassion? 
And what's fascinating about this is the whole reason that he asked the clarifying question of Jesus of who is my neighbor is he wanted to make sure that he could clearly state that compassion was conditional and only certain people were worthy of it. In the mind of the Jewish religious elite at the time, there were only certain people who were worthy of compassion. In fact, there was a saying amongst the rabbis at the time of Jesus, or at least right around the same epoch historically, that the purpose of a Gentile, of a non-Jew, was solely to fuel the fires of hell. That was just kind of what they, that was their worldview, okay? And so for the Jewish religious elite, there was this thin slice of people who were worthy of compassion. Everybody else, let God sort them out, right? Which ironically was um, from a Roman Catholic crusade about a thousand years after this. But they did not have compassion unless you fit a certain box of who was worthy of compassion. I don't think that is unique to the Jewish religious elite that Jesus was talking to. As people, because of a sinful world, because of our brokenness, because of our experience, because of our hurts, because of our culture, I think we all have this box that we've drawn of those who are worthy of our compassion. And we all make it differently, right? For some people, it's just the people that I know really well are worthy of compassion because I just look. We talked about this in the beginning, right? I don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of energy. I don't have time to be compassionate, man. And I feel, listen, I feel this. When I am at my most stressed and frantic and anxious, I am the least compassionate. I mean, here's, let me just, literally this morning, I'm trying to get to church. Um, I spelled one of the slides wrong, so I'm coming up here. I'm trying to eat so I'm not just a miserable human being. And in my neighborhood, because we live in North Georgia, there's a lot of two things in my neighborhood. There's hills and there's curves, okay? Now, everyone in my neighborhood has a driveway. Some people apparently find it easier in the least convenient part of the neighborhood, a sharp curve that you can't see around, to instead of parking on their driveway, they park in front of their house, which means you're swerving into oncoming traffic in a blind curve, which in theory, everyone should be driving slowly, but it doesn't always happen. So for me, I will tell you, when I am in a hurry, I have no compassion for these people that don't have the common sense to park in the driveway. They're inconveniencing me. Through their audacity, of making me drive around their car in a blind curve. Now, if I'm not in a hurry, if I'm just meandering down to the tennis court or I'm, you know, going to lunch or we're going to the grocery store, I don't mind the car so much. But when they're inconveniencing me, I no longer have space in my compassion box for them. I just don't. I'm tired. It takes energy. And they're ticking me off. <laughs> don't park there. There's big signs. There's not, but there should be, right? Maybe you can relate. (laughs) Maybe you can relate to this. When we are tired and stressed out, we don't have compassion. That box just shrinks a little bit. Listen, others of us, and unfortunately, if we've grown up in church, we may have experienced the bad end of this. Sometimes even in church, we have a compassion box. There's the good people that we love, and then there's the bad people that we don't, right? I grew up in a a tradition... um, that was very much black and white. You were in or you were out, and it was very much based on your behavior. There were the good people that we could love, and then there were the bad people that watched The Simpsons and listened to Metallica, and we shouldn't love them too much because, you know, they're those people. We all have these boxes of those people. And what's interesting is that the fact that the Samaritan is the person in the story that shows compassion is that Jesus is reframing the understanding of who his neighbor is and who is worthy of compassion. And he's reframing this box that they had built culturally of who was worthy of compassion and saying, no, 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 no. Humanity is worthy of compassion. Another way of saying this is if the Samaritan is acting as a neighbor, then your neighbor is everybody. There is no one who's not your neighbor if even the Samaritan is in. There is not a boundary in which we are exempt from loving someone the way that God loved them. And so that starts with being compassionate. There's a lot of reasons that people speculate why the first two people didn't touch the guy. Some people said, oh, well, it's because they're priests. If they touch them, they're unclean. Other people say, yeah, but they were leaving the temple. They, they didn't have that restriction on them. But there's a lot of arguments about why they might or might not have helped the guy in the ditch. But here's what we know. Whatever their reason, they were completely devoid of compassion for the reality of someone hurting. What differentiated the one who was the neighbor and the one who wasn't was the one who showed compassion. Even the legal expert gets that at the end of the story. And Jesus asked him, who was the neighbor? He said, well, the one that showed compassion. 
And Jesus said, you're right, go and do likewise. And he says, you go and show compassion for everyone. So how do we do that? Our compassion starts with our eyes. Do we see people as a hindrance? Do we see people as evil? Do we see people in these categories of good enough and not good enough? Do we see people as what they can help us with? If you can advance my life and my career, then I'll have some compassion on you. If you can't help me, then you're worthless, right? Like, we would never say it that way, but it's, it's how we say it in our heart. Um, man, in a religious setting, there, there is no one who is not welcome to be loved by us as a church. What about their sin? Well, that's great. He never said affirm sin. He just said have compassion, right? You can do both of those. You don't have to choose one. We don't have to choose loving someone and um, <laughs> dealing with sin. Like both are possible because God showed us that both were possible with us. And so are we a people who live with a rhythm of compassion? That starts with our eyes. It starts with our eyes. How do you see the people who are hurting in the world around you? Do you notice them? Do you know their names? Do you see what's wrong with them? Can you diagnose the pain and the hurt that's happening around you? And I think it's easy for us to really kind of, we'll talk about this in a minute, but um, it's easy for us to boil this down to certain categories of hurting, right? But the reality is that there is a need for compassion in a variety of ways. Are we building a community that is running on a rhythm of compassion where we see the needs and the hurt of the world around us? Let's keep going here. The Samaritan goes on. After he has compassion on him, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, which is actually sort of ironic because this idea of oil and wine are both actually symbolic references to what priests would do. And so there's almost this way that he is acting as the priest and the Levite should have been acting um, in a sense that they weren't. And so even that is this layer of look at how he is administering worship and how he is caring for this person. Then he set him on his own animal, that meant that he was walking, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And so this is super important because here's what we see him do. We don't just see him look at the guy and have compassion and move on. Compassion has a natural overflow of action. If you have compassion, then you do something. Looking and saying, oh man, that's too bad, and moving on is not actually compassion. That's just sympathy. Those are, those are two different ideas. He has compassion, which is an overflow into action. So here's the second rhythm that we want to hit is a rhythm of healing. Are we a community that is a place of healing? And there are pages and pages filled in history books and autobiographies of churches that were a place of hurt and not a place of healing, right? Where, where people were put outside of the box of those worthy to be loved, where people were ignored or cast aside because they didn't help advance the mission of the church, or the brand of the church. There's people that are easy to love and people that are hard to love, and there's way too much history in the church throughout the world, throughout the very time of its inception that have been cast aside by the church because they were just a little bit too difficult. That's not who God calls us to be. The church is not an organization that is fueled by the life and energy of the people in a way that they exist only to further the size and brand of the church. The church is the body of Christ that exists to care for and shepherd the people of God. And so for us to do that well, we have to be a church that is a place of healing. And you see this as he's giving this example of compassion that after compassion, there's healing. He actually attends to what's wrong with a guy. So do we live in a rhythm of healing? So much of what we're talking about with spiritual care is a massive step towards being people that walk into wounding to point people to healing, right? And I know this is tricky because on some level, there are wounds that you and I cannot heal for other people, and we shouldn't try to. Those are unhealthy boundaries. But we can be a people that point them to the source of healing. We can be a people that point them to the truth of the gospel, that help with resources, that help point to counseling, that help plug into community, that help give relationship. You don't have to physically heal someone to be a part of being a community that has a pattern of people being healed, right? And listen, like I said, healing doesn't always look like what we think of when we think of kind of that social justice box of, well, they need food, they need a job, they need clothes. For sure, that, that's a part of it. But there is wounding in upper-class white-collar affluence 
just as much as there is on the other end of the spectrum in poverty. Wounds are pretty universal because we live in a sinful, broken world. And so the question isn't who needs healing, it's how does someone need to be healed? Because regardless of who you are, of where you were born, of where you live, of how much you make, of what kind of car you drive, there is brokenness that happens as a result of sin. And so for a church community that is living in a compassion of love, we are a church community that is bent towards calling people into a place where healing is happening, right? I don't mean like in a Benny Hinn way where you come on the stage and I slap you and you come. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is we should be a place where relational wounds are healed, where the sick are prayed for, and we ask God to move and heal in them, where we have trauma that is unpacked, where we have access to and a safety in pursuing biblical therapy, right? It is okay for us to say that mental health can be addressed by licensed professionals. That's not actually unbiblical. God gave us brains, God gave us training, and God gave us degrees for a reason. It is okay for us to pursue those. It's okay. You go to a doctor for a broken leg, you can go to a doctor to address mental health. That is good. And as a church, we should be encouraging of that. We should be pointing people to those resources. We should be stepping towards pain and listening to those that are hurting. It's not enough just to say, hey, man, I'm glad you're here. Hope things get better. We want to be a people that step towards being agents of God's healing a broken and hurt world. It doesn't take very long if we are using our eyes to build a rhythm of compassion for us to see that there's, there's a lot of wounds. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of trauma. As a church, we, we've been called to step into that. It doesn't mean that you personally can heal everything that's wrong with somebody. I need to brain some of my type A and people in right now. It's like, all right, I'm ready. But we can be a people who love those that are hurting, that help them identify what is wrong and help them get the help that they need. We can be a people that pray and ask for God to heal. We can be a people that help people find resources and freedom and safety to say, I need help. That's, that's the picture we see. So we want to be a people that build this rhythm of healing. Is this a place where people find healing? Rather than a place where people find guilt and shame or, hey, you're only as useful to us as what you can provide. Let's keep going and end out here. The next day, he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. That's like three weeks pay. Saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. Jesus asked, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell to the robbers? The legal official said, the one who showed him mercy or compassion. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So let's look at the last thing he did here at the risk of over exegeting into the application phase. One of the ways that he brought him healing caused him some investment, right? There is an investment that he makes here. In this guy. He doesn't know him, but he is paying for the hotel, if you can call it that, and he's paying for his food, and it's costing him something. There is a way in which his compassion leads to an investment in that person who is hurting. This is not a, hey, give money to the church. That's not what this is, okay? Um, This is simply a reality that if we are caring and if we are healing, we're also going to find that there's a rhythm of investment, right? The last place that we look to in this rhythm is that we've got to be a people who live with a rhythm of investment in those that are hurt. And so the question is, what does that look like? You know, for this guy, his investment was making sure that this guy had a safe place. For a lot of us, frankly, the easiest investment that we could make is writing a check. That's not all of us. But for a lot of us, frankly, the easiest thing we could do is write a check. It's a couple seconds of our time. We might miss it, but it'll probably be fine the next month. Sometimes... Sometimes the investment that we're called to make is our time and our energy, right? Sometimes that's a much more difficult check to write, is the check on our calendar. Um, The check in our day, the check in our evening, the check of our convenience, the check of something that maybe feels like it would be more fun. Regardless of what the investment looks like, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's relational, whether it's temporal, Compassion and healing will always come out of the investment that we are making in the people around us. And so we want to be a place that lives in a rhythm where we are investing in one another. 
We want to be a place that is living in a rhythm where it is normal for us to say, I know that this might cost me something, but because I believe that God loves me and is vested in me, I'm going to do the same. And there's this cost in community that we pay, and here's why. So the reason that we love the world is because we understand that that is God's heart. Everything we do as disciples is not so that God will love us or so that we can be saved. Everything that we do as disciples is an overflow of our understanding of who God is. That's even true in how Jesus is teaching Torah here. He's not saying, do this and inherit eternal life because it's not really something you can inherit, like you can earn. An inheritance is given. He's saying, do this as a reflection of your understanding of who God is. So why would we invest in people that are hurting? What did God do? God invested in people that were hurting. How did he do that? Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we talk about celebrating communion as the cornerstone and foundation of our worship on a Sunday, it is because it is the primary way that Jesus has asked us to worship him. It roots us in the reality of why we are children of God, of why we were forgiven and have new life and an eternal hope. There was an investment made in our souls that we could not afford, that covered and forgave a sin that we could not overcome by ourselves. Our faith is rooted in the investment that Jesus Christ made on the cross of his flesh and his blood so that we could be being new, that we could be made clean, and we could be transformed. And so we celebrate that, and we model that. We were shown a picture of love that is sacrificial by a God who loved us. So as a community that seeks to follow him and reflect his heart to the world, we want to be a people who love sacrificially, not out of convenience, not out of obligation, but out of joy and out of a desire to reflect the heart of God to a hurting world, we want to be a people that love the way that God loved us. And we're reminded of the cost of God's love every day. And we celebrate it because the result of that investment is that we have been made new. We've been made a new people, we've been given a new hope, and we've been given a new eternity. And so this morning, as we consider building these rhythms, my hope is that we will continue to be a community that is marked by how we love one another. That we would be a people who live in these rhythms, these rhythms of compassion, these rhythms of healing, and these rhythms of investment. And as a response to the joy that we have in Jesus Christ and the life that he has called us to, we celebrate what he did for us on the cross. And as we celebrate, just a reminder as we come to the table and celebrate, this is a celebration. This is a celebration. If you don't know Christ, if you're not a Christ follower, we would encourage you to not partake of this because it's not something that you've made a connection with. Um, it's, it's It's not a celebration that you have participated in yet. We wish that you would. Um, but we want to be we want to be mindful in how we steward that spiritual reality. And just for your own sake, we would just ask that you would join us in prayer. Um, pursue the truth of the gospel and, and, and just hold off on, on celebrating until your faith has been put in Jesus Christ. Um, and we eagerly await that day. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you for your word and that you have called us to love the people around us. God, we pray that we would be a community that lives in a rhythm of loving people well. Help us to be a people that love with compassion and healing. Help us to be a people that invest in the hurting and the broken. Um, God, just reprioritize our values to line up with the heart that you have for those around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.